Hey, everybody, and welcome to Mindset Reset, and I'm your host, Ben Newton. You know, in these unprecedented times we're living in, it's pretty easy to feel overwhelmed. I don't know about you guys, but I, I do some days, and, and that's why we created this series. We wanted to bring a little sunshine through the clouds and hopefully lift, lift a little bit of that burden that we're all navigating through right now. So to to start with that, you know, I'm, inter- I'm excited to introduce my guest, Sean Acor. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's got you know, three books, The Happiness Advantage, Before Happiness, and Big Potential, which are all great books. Uh, he's winner of a more of a dozen distinguished teaching awards at Harvard University. He's one of the most popular TED speakers uh, with over 20 million views. That's amazing. And one of the world's leading experts on the connection between happiness and success. Welcome, Sean. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're both... Uh, doing um the uh our recording here sheltered in place i guess it started for you last night i've been in it a week now so uh how are things going on your side (laughs) it's going pretty well um given everything that's going on we've got our two-year-old and our six-year-old at home so we spent the morning doing a hogwarts homeschool for them (laughs) i even dressed up and had a little stuffed owl and we did potions and spells and uh, we're trying to make the best of it with the time that we have together you know, I, I want to see pictures of that later. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we're, I've got a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, so it's been uh, it's been pretty it's been pretty interesting. But um, you know, really, you know, getting right into it, you know, we we've partnered with with Sean uh, to bring you guys a four-part series. So this is going to be in four different parts, and really, it's about focusing on mindset uh in the crisis and you know one of the reasons we we brought sean into this is just sean brings an amazing viewpoint uh that we found really impactful for ourselves and we wanted to share it with all of you and in each of the four episodes we're going to cover a different topic where sean's going to share um, his experience and some practical suggestions uh, about things that we can do every day to create a positive mindset and actually make a difference in, in your day to day but before we even get started on that, you know, to kind of set a basis and, and get us into the right mindset, um, Sean, talk a little bit about rational optimism and what that means and, and set the groundwork for everything else we're going to talk about. Um, I think it's fascinating. It's so important right now for us to realize that um, happiness isn't about turning a blind eye to the challenges that are going on in the world, um, but also do you think that happiness is possible right now? Um, I got started doing all this research in the midst of the financial crisis in 2008. So my very first um, studies were with the banks as they were collapsing and they had no idea whether or not they were going to be able to recover or if the economy would ever recover. And very quickly, what we started to realize is that people were falling into two traps. They were either uh, turning a blind eye to the world or sugarcoating the world and creating this irrational optimism that everything's gonna be fine, we don't even need to worry about it, let's not prepare for anything. and they didn't fare very well. Um, the other side um, would see all the world seeming to collapse around them and they'd become paralyzed. And they'd be like, well, I'm not gonna work until I see what's gonna happen yeah. or what's gonna, uh, what's gonna occur in the future. And they become paralyzed by the crisis. Um, what I've been researching and what we see that causes optimists to thrive in the midst of even high challenge or crisis is a rational optimistic uh, assessment of the world. So you mm. start, you start with realism. You start with looking at what's going on in the news and the projections of where this is going or how this is gonna impact your family or the economy around you. You start with a realistic assessment of the present, but you maintain the belief that eventually my behavior will matter if I'm linked to the right people, virtually or in, in, in hopefully eventually uh, in, in physical spaces. But what that allows us to do is to not turn a blind eye to the problem, But it also allows our brain to believe that there are things we could be doing in the short term that actually might make us more adaptive. Um, Because what we're finding is that the irrational optimist and the the, uh, defensive pessimist both end up making mistakes right now. What we're looking for is uh, that path forward. Well, that, that, that's a really good, um, you know, way to set it up, because I I think it, uh, it is really easy to feel trapped by things you can't control and 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 actually that's that's a that's a pretty amazing balance between the two so you know with with that as the backdrop for our our first topic you know one thing we were just talking about now we're we're both being told to social distance uh you know and that's been a that's been an adjustment trying to explain that to my to my kids in particular and and you know 
one of the one of the things that we struggle with that is maintaining social connection and all that because we don't want to lose that social connection. And I know, particularly as an extrovert, that's been a little hard, uh, you know, figuring out how to how to do that. And so we, we, we wanted to, you know, kind of start right off with that. So how do you how do you look at that? Because uh, honestly, that's that's the one of the best places to start. How do you think about social connection in a time like right now where you're actually being told to, you know, stay at your house most of the time? Yeah, it was one of the things I was most concerned about with social distancing is that uh, we know based upon this research, it's the cornerstone of the work that I do, that the greatest predictor of long-term levels of happiness is our social support network. It's the breadth, it's the depth and the meaning in our social relationships. So unlike in other crises where we can band together and meet up and go to, you know, religious services together and go meet up at a nonprofit together and start to do this work, we're actually more isolated in the midst of this. Um, and yet, exactly what we saw during the financial crisis, we're seeing a, an interesting trend start to emerge. Um, we're actually finding social connection rising um, in, in a surprising way. Part of it yeah. is that I, you know, I'm now home with my kids. I get a lot more time with my kids than I ever have because normally I'm doing work, but with very weak ties, right? People I go out and speak to that I might not ever see again, right? And instead, mm. I'm spending all this quality time with my kids. Um, in addition to that, that uh, the family unit, um, what we're finding is like just last night, I spent uh, three hours um, on a, uh, you know FaceTime with some friends who are in Missouri, um, and we didn't have to get childcare to spend three hours with each yeah. other at eight o'clock at night. Um, we actually got to do a double date, but virtually. And we have never spent that long together. Um, and we have another date we've got tonight uh, with another couple. Um, and when we're going out walking, we're walking so much more. We're starting to see all these neighbors that we've never talked to before start to um, open up and start to talk to one another. So what we're finding is social connection is the perception of social connection that matters, right? So what we're finding is that um, oftentimes we have these deep relationships in our life we're just ignoring them because we're going through our inbox or we're doing the work that we have, or we have so much going on within our lives that how often are we reaching out to our best friends from college or the friends that we haven't seen since so we moved away from, uh, from Virginia or the, or the, you know, I, I've been talking to my parents every single day. Um, yeah. And that normally is once a week. So what we're finding is I actually think social connection is starting to rise um, as people are, reconnecting in the midst of this, um, even though it's virtually, um, it's a fascinating period of time, but one that I could actually, I think is so crucial because this social connection will be the greatest predictor of our resilience and optimism and happiness during this time of challenge. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting you say that, you know, one, one question that, you know, kind of occurred to me because in dealing with my colleagues and some, some people I know, you know, you and I both, we, we, we have kids, we, we have our, we're family there and it's, um, it adds it adds some work, uh, you know. There, not in a bad way, but uh, but it also there's like there's an instant unit there. You know, you you have that social, and like you said, uh, I've I've been spending a lot more time with them lately, obviously. But you know, if you're if you're single, or um, you know, maybe your roommates went and you're the one staying behind. There's a lot of different reasons why that might be. But if you don't have that immediate, um, you know, group around, I mean, how do you what do you think is the best way to go about that? So I think there's two things. One is um, an awareness that it's not just social connection. It's feeling like that you have a meaningful impact upon the people around you. Mm. So um, there's some people that I don't even know. Um, I don't know if they're single. I don't know if they have kids or anything, but they set up this bear hunt that's going on here in Dallas where, uh, and maybe this is happening in other places, but there's a book about going on a bear hunt. It's a kid's book. And what they did was they know all these kids are stuck in their homes or going on these walks. And so what they did as a, as a community is you walk around and you can see these bears stuck in the windows. So the kids, as they walk around, <laughs> get to see these bears that might be put up by uh, empty nesters or might be put up by uh, people that are single living in these homes. They're now contributing and feeling like they're having a meaningful uh, impact upon these kids at home. I think it's small things like that, but I think it's the small things that matter most during these big crises. Um, and and one of the great examples of that is that um, one of the things that I study in the, um, is how we can make these small pivot points in our life that can yeah. raise our levels of happiness and social connection. One of them is, um, and this is one of the ones that I share when I give talks, is uh, having people just write a two-minute positive email each day, praising or thanking someone in their life. Um, very simple action, right? And so easy to do now that we have fewer emails 
and we're separated from one another to just send a two minute text message or email praising or thinking or reconnecting to someone in your life. The reason that's important is that when you look at your mental map of your social connection, what oftentimes happens is we think, you know, here are my family and when I'm going through a crisis and here are maybe my two or three best friends, right? If someone's single, yeah. they might not have that or someone's feeling isolated or alone or they're trapped in a certain part of the world away from their social connection, they might feel that they don't have that. But remember, it's the perception of social connection. So what happens is as we could try and get people for 21 days in a row to think of a new person and email them a two minute um, um, uh, thank you note or piece of praise or a reconnection. Um, what happens is around day eight, almost everyone feels like they run out of people, right? Yeah, They're like, yeah. oh, that was everyone. That's all my friends and family. And I already wrote to my mom twice. Um, <laughs> and then what you find is that you start to scan and it's the scanning that matters for the brain. Um, and this is the, 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 the crucial and beautiful part is your brain starts to look for these other people in your life that you haven't been aware of consciously, mm. but they're there. Like um, I, I described how I, I wrote to a high school English teacher and said, you were the reason I fell in love with reading. You're the reason I wrote a book, wrote her a short little email. Um, and she wrote back, right. And she shared it with her class. And then we did a, a little video time for her, her students. Oh, and awesome. what was amazing was when I now think about my people, she lights up on my mental map. Right, so those people are there. It's a perception. So if somebody's single, if they're alone, if they they have mentors in their life that have got them to where they are, they have people that they work with that they might not have connected too deeply. They have neighbors and people that help them in the community and people that are, are religious. Whatever it is, your brain starts to scan and you find more and more of them, and you realize that there's greater levels of connection than you ever thought was possible. You know, that's that's really interesting when when you talk about that, Sean. Because I two things. Um, come to mind is one that I, I've definitely even noticed myself is there's probably a tendency to be a little lazy about this, particularly when you work in a, in a, in a, in an office or you, you go into a, a setting, this, you know, same thing every day is you run into people. And there's always that thing is like the, the people I have the strongest connection with are the people that I have the random uh, connection with every day. And it's something I've definitely noticed is that you have to bring a purpose, a purposefulness to your your connections now it's not you there's no none of the quote-unquote water cooler stuff anymore it's right a, yeah you actually have to make time put it on the on the on the schedule which is which is interesting and i, I could really potentially have a pretty positive change on how we interact with people because it's forcing us to do it right yeah you know what i think you, you know just like as we always say that like you know we write eulogies for people you know after they die when we should have said that stuff to them where, while we were alive right, <laughs> right. Like, there's this moment that comes I think we're in a moment now where we don't have these physical interactions that we took for granted. So there's an incredible and easy move, you know, as soon as someone listens to this, to write to the person that is, you know, the person that brightens their day every time they come into work, or you're my best friend at work and I miss getting to see you all the time. Or, you know, like every time I see you, whenever it's at work, it cheers me up. So I'm definitely am aware of that positive impact you've had upon me. So you immediately have this opportunity to share something that you've never shared before that we might have been needing to say earlier. And there's been that great research that found that like, if you have a best friend at work, your productivity rises dramatically. Your likelihood to stay with the company rises dramatically. Like that question that they thought was a throwaway question was actually one of the greatest predictors of happiness at work. Oh, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I would, uh, I, would, I would definitely say for myself, like the people that I, I sit around make it, you know, really kind of bring you through the the you know the times when it's, you got a lot more going on and right yeah but then it's easy to it's easy to forget that particularly with with kids and everything going on I, you know that i need to maintain that connection you know and one thing that comes to mind I, I wonder what you think about this is that for a completely different reason i was um involved in a in a class and it was about keeping connections with people you know in normal times but it, he even uh, encouraged us to just go down and spend some significant time and just write names yeah. down and yeah. you literally go through the names and check them off. You get all the way through and then right back up to the top again. So it was, it was an it was a really interesting exercise that helped me because it was like here's all the people that I have connection with that I want to stay f connected with. I'm just going to write them all down and then I'm just going to make a point of getting through that list on a certain period. Right. Yeah, I find even just checking in with people like I'm a little bit more on the introverted side. So to randomly send somebody a text. Like, I kind of feel like I need to reason sometimes, like it's gotta be good. Yeah. And I feel like I'm trying to get rid of that and just be like, hey, I just wanna find out how you and your family are doing. I'm thinking about you. Like, this gives me an opportunity. I've connected back to so many people that have been on my list of people I wanted to connect with over the past week because I just sit at home with my kids and 
you know, we, we have recess in our homeschool now, right? Like uh, we call it marine training. So I'm getting all their energy out. Um, and, uh, you know, I pull out my phone, I can write a quick text to somebody I haven't talked to in a while and be like, I'm just hoping you're okay. And like, I hope your parents are okay. And that little text starts these whole conversations that flower on the backside of it. So um, that's what we saw during the financial crisis. We actually saw social connection rising. And that's partly because we trimmed back some of the work that was being done that allowed us to replace it either with more Netflix, right? Which yeah. is definitely happening, but also with these you know, great, uh, great quality interactions that only seem to happen sometimes in, in difficult times. If you think about it, uh, the, I've been doing some work with the military um, and they create these deep social bonds because they go through the hardest things together. Right, like mm -hmm. they onboard you with boot camp so that you have these meaningful narratives that bond people together. I think that this is one of those bonding situations that we're going to talk about for 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 years and years. Right, I don't think anyone's going to talk about you know 2017 five years from now, but I think 2020 we'll be talking about for you know 30, 40, 50, 100 years. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. You know, and one one thing that uh, you were saying that brought something to mind is one thing that I've definitely noticed is uh you know people helping each other out in the neighborhood not even just going out and talking to people like you know with a proper social distance of course but uh also getting groceries and doing errands for maybe for the people that can't really get out because they're you know they're they're one of the more um at risk groups or something like that and 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 it does seem to be really helping those people and i know for myself personally if i didn't have my kids and my wife that i could invest in here i i definitely think it would be more of a struggle so why is why is that the case i mean is that something helpful that people can do and why does that seem so helpful um altruism um is one of the the greatest forms of creating happiness because what we find mm -hmm. is you get a ceiling effect if happiness is just about you i've been thinking about a lot of this uh with my mm -hmm. wife as well um because in the midst of this, we have no idea how long that this is going to last for, nor do we know how bad it's yeah. going to be. So we can try and take a realistic assessment, but there's uncertainty that comes along with it. And I think there's multiple responses. And, you know, I think you go through all of them, just like you go through stages of grief, um, right? <laughs> so like there's anger phase and the denial phase. And I think, you know, the United States went through the denial phase. And um, I think that there's anger, confusion and frustration that all comes... And so I think in the midst of this, you can start to feel paralyzed. Like what is gonna to happen to my finances or to my kids or to the country, right? And you can panic. Um, then there's another response above that, I believe, that you can hunker down with your family and make the best of it. And I think that that's a better response than a panic one. But I think that there's one, I think we're gonna cap our levels of happiness if that's where we stop. Um, we're trying to hunker down as family to make sure that we're okay emotionally, spiritually, financially. Um, but then if we don't move to other people, our happiness will, will actually stagnate or plummet. Um, cause what we're yeah. finding is it's growth that causes our highest levels of happiness. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It, it's not, you're happy only when you reach self-actualization or once you deal with the basic needs, it's the growth up through the chart towards mm -hmm. seeing who you really are. So once you've hunkered down, once you are okay, um, then it's time to start thinking about those other people. Right. And so yeah. I think that this is where heroes can come, right? It's, it's the people that, you know, are healthy right now that are going out and bringing toilet paper to 80 year olds. And so they don't have to yeah. go. Um, this is, I, I'm seeing so many people out in the neighborhood who are like walking around and then they just stop. And then they have these, they're six feet apart from one another, but they just sit there and talk for like an hour <laughs> with one another, right? Like that they've, like they're trying to create these deeper connections with people that feel shut in all the time. So I think that's where it is, is how can, how can we find ways of being altruistic? It's giving something to somebody else, it's reconnecting with them, it's emotionally being there for them. Even on text message, we're finding that those things make us feel like that we're part of a solution instead of paralyzed by it. Yeah, and I mean, I guess tying it back to the to the social support idea you had is is maybe tell me if this makes sense, but it's like through that altruism, you're increasing someone else's uh, perception of social support, right? That's it. Yeah, and if you want even bigger one, um, I, I I might get a little bit of flack for saying this, but I I think that what you're seeing in the world as the you know the governments are shutting down movement for this disease. This disease in large part doesn't seem to be impacting the young as much as it is for the older people, right? So what yeah. we're finding is that a lot of what's occurring here is I think one of the largest selfless 
uh, acts that's been done by the entire world all at once, right? Because my family and I are probably gonna be okay, right? But we are staying home because we really wanna care for that 80 year old who's alone and feeling isolated who is susceptible or a 40 year old or a kid who has high levels of you know, uh, pre, pre existing conditions, right? right? So what you're seeing is the entire world uh, doing one of the most selfless acts together. Um, and I don't wanna make too positive uh, uh, on the backside of it because I think it's gonna cause some economic downturns, it's gonna cause a lot of challenges in the future. But if you're looking for social connection, you can see it even in the fact that we're staying home. Yeah, well, and I mean, that's one of the, you see a lot of instances that through history, the, the uh, um, you know, the, some of these big events uh, like like this, like you know, they, they bring out the, the best and the worst. And I mean, what we're talking about here is that you, you can make a, you can make a decision to let it bring out the best in you. Right. Um, well, I, I think this this is really great, Sean. And just to kind of summarize for everybody listening, you know, there's a some really practical things you can do here. You know, first, take that time to, uh, you know, write down the, the people you want to stay in touch with, maybe the people you haven't stayed in touch with, and take that a little time every day just to write a two-minute email, to send a text, uh, to stay in touch, and, and that'll definitely reap rewards for you and for them. And then also think about how you can you know, uh, do something for somebody else, uh, you know, uh, uh, do something altruistic and, and that'll actually uh, help you change your mindset and, and also do something for their mindset as well. 